we're getting back to work on the 483 stroker build for scanner Danner. Today we're going to be doing our torque plate hone to get the bores to the finished size for the pistons that CP Carrillo did up for us. We had a custom set of pistons come in from them. Uh, they helped us out a little bit on it, kind of joining us as a partner on the build here. So we're going to be checking these out here using the MC1, making sure that they look as good as we want them to. I'm sure they will because CP Carrillo is one of the biggest, nicest names in the industry. I did find this guy wandering around. Do you have any, do you have any advice for how we should uh, go Can about doing you? this? Yeah, like I just figured a homeless guy is probably the best, best guy to get help from. I'm the best thing that's ever happened to you. So in reality, uh, this is Josh from Engine Rehab on YouTube. I needed help because I'm, <laughs> I'm in over my head, so called in one of the experts, obviously. Kind of having you help out with some of the uh, cylinder head stuff on this build, just oh, yeah. kind of a collaboration here. So I flew you out to help us out, but we're working on the block right now. Gonna get started here. We'll kind of, I, I might just have you hold the camera and we'll check out the pistons a little bit and mm -hmm. you can offer any criticism you have to anything I'm doing and we'll go from there. Wonderful. Again, this, these are a custom set of pistons, 4255 bore for the Mopar here. We're targeting 10 to one compression ratio. So they did end up with about a 21 cc dish and some little tiny valve reliefs. When you fill out one of these forms, I honestly had never ordered custom pistons before. This is another thing that Josh kind of helped me out with here. Basically, you have to tell them everything about your build. Uh, so we sent them what heads we were using. We sent them our camshaft specs. We sent them uh, what we were shooting for on compression ratio. And they came up with a set of custom pistons for us. Two little tiny valve reliefs there. That's all it really needed. They're set up for our stroker build. so. I guess talk about the piston a little bit. CP was really our number one choice here. Uh, they're right on the other side of the state from me. They're in Irvine, California. You're not gonna get a much nicer piston than this. We've got some nice trick flow heads to go on this uh, 413 stroker. The valve lever reliefs are really cool. That's actually gonna, uh, that's kind of just a factor of this big old dish here. But one of the nice things about CP is they'll do anything you want. One of the best things you can do with an old engine is modernize it with a better ring pack. Here we've got a one millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeter ring pack. This is the same ring that's used in different levels of motorsports. The nice metric ring pack offers a lot of conformability, so it's gonna help us maintain a really good ring seal as the cylinders move around during normal operation. And another thing that's really gonna add is once this thing's assembled, I'll almost bet you that we can get this rotating torque under 20 pounds. Uh, often enough, we can even get these things to rotate with uh, 18 pounds of braking force. What that is, is when you put a torque wrench on the crank bolt and just rotate your short block, you're going to see that it takes 15, 18 pounds to get it to rotate. And then beyond that, we might even get down as low as 10 pounds to, to maintain that rotation. And what that means is horsepower. Uh, another thing is these rings are really nice to the cylinder bores. Everything's going to work really well, and this will be a good running, long lasting engine. And hopefully it'll do a good job of uh, knocking Paul's socks off. <laughs> That's the goal, right? Uh, one of the best things about the CP pistons is all that finish work. This is all chamfering done in the CNC machine. A lot of companies do it by hand. Either way is fine, but they actually take the time to add, an, add a line into their code to come in and just chamfer all the edges on their parts. Another thing is they've got really nice force pin oiling. So as this piston comes down the cylinder bores, the oil comes up the oil ring and then goes through these little holes right here. Yep. And you can see that they're all around the side of the piston. And then that ultimately ends up inside of the wrist pin bore. 
help keeps things cool, add some lubrication, gives it a nice little cushion to uh, ride on, and that's going to add to the longevity formula that we're going for. Okay. So another thing, just thinking here, we're getting ready to hone the block. We've got our diamond set up here so that we can hopefully get some really nice board geometry and the proper surface finish. And far before anything on surface finish, we have to think about, do we have the correct size? What, what bore are we going to? Uh, 4255. 4250, I'd say that's about average. <laughs> When we filled out this, the order form, we put down what our final bore size was gonna be, and the piston is manufactured to have the clearance in it. So right. they've kind of gone off of what the application is, all the different specs and everything, and they've come up with what our clearance needs to be. Realistically, we could have finished this block to our finished size, and the piston should have come in at the correct, correct size, right? Yep, that's right, that's how it's supposed to work. You should be able to Pick a nominal size. Nominal would be four inch 250. Uh, after rough boring the block and then putting the torque plate on and then coming up with our uh, deciding what our final bore size was gonna be, we decided that four inch 250 wouldn't give us enough room to get it to final size and keep a proper uh, bore geometry. Uh, so we went to four inch 255. CP Carrillo went and found us a very nice five over ring pack, so that wasn't an issue at all. Uh, ideally, you're gonna be in a situation like we are where you've got plenty of time, you can pick out a bore size uh, and then just wait for them to come in. If you decide that you wanna add a little more clearance for a power adder or anything to that effect, then you'll be able to do that. But if you are crunched on time, things are gonna get in close to race day, you actually could just final hone your cylinder bores, tell them, hey, I'm at four inch 250. They'll send you a set of pistons. It'll have the clearance built right into the skirts. And you can absolutely bet that they're gonna be on size, especially with CP. We're just gonna go through and check them, measure them out, see how they look, uh, and then get into honing the block real quick. So Perfect. I had only ever had one of these out of the box at a time. So I hadn't given this much thought, but uh, what did we just discover? I'm very, very, very shocked. It's actually kind of cool. Uh, CP actually went through a tremendous effort to give us left and right pistons. These old engines, uh, Mopars, small block Chevys, FEs, the valve order changes depending on what cylinder you're on. So a lot of piston manufacturers are gonna just give you the same valve relief from piston to piston. And CP actually took the time and gave us left and right intake pockets. And that is wonderful. So if you're not paying attention, that could be an issue. But I, if you're doing something <laughs> to this degree, I highly doubt that you're just going to throw these types of engines uh, together. Yeah. Now, another thing, I'm noticing some of this profiling here. Most manufacturers, the, the, they'll just do a nice slash cut across the side of this piston, but there's a nice radius built into that wrist pin area. And that's really gonna help us lighten things up because now that wrist pin, instead of being yay wide, you know, we're actually coming up to about here to there. That half an inch that they took away from the wrist pin width is really gonna take away from the reciprocating weight of the piston. And it's just a hell of a lot better, a lighter weight, uh, lighter reciprocating weights are gonna be nicer to the parts and you, it's gonna reduce any wear and any stress on the rest of the, on the rotating assembly as a whole. Sweet, impressive. So CP specifies that you need to measure your skirt diameter at half an inch up from the bottom of the skirt. And that's really easy to do consistently on the MC1 here. So I'll just walk you through here, how we make sure that we're at that height and setting our uh, using the standard to set our size here, and then we can go through real quick and measure all eight. This indicator over here is what's gonna tell us what height the micrometer is at relative to the bottom of the skirt when we get it on there. So the way we adjust this is we have a half inch diameter gauge block over here. This one is a 375, which when you add to half the diameter of the anvil of the mic, is going to add up to half an inch to tell us where the center point of that is. And just kind of rubbing it there, it got tight right when this indicator reads zero, or well, actually it's adjusted to half an inch. So uh, we know that that's exactly where we need to be to measure our pistons with the mic zeroed out. We'll take a four inch standard 
just kind of rock that back and forth to find the high spot. And I'll adjust that just a tiny bit. So now this gauge with that being at zero and this being at zero, we know that that's exactly four inches. So if we adjust this out to 4255, in theory, that would be our bore size between the two points when this gauge reads up to zero. And we can just grab one of our pistons. According to our spec sheet, they should be 42505. Rock it till I find the high spot. And right there, 42502 and a half. So that's honestly probably accounted for in the difference in temperature between my shop and their shop and difference in the way they're measured. 42506. 42508, 42502, 42506, 42501, 42499, and 42506. So six tenths maybe from the nom from the size they said. Half tell, perfect. So I think uh, I think we're safe to just go to our 4255 and absolutely call it a day. In this torque plate here, I made up some spacers so that we have uh, the same dimension from the deck of the block to the underside of the bolt as the trick flow heads that we're using. And these are trick flow studs as well. So I'm going to put some die on the cylinders and that'll give you and I a nice visual representation of what the torque plate is doing. So we got this big old 7 16 thread for the head bolts. They're real close to the bores and I guarantee you that it's going to change the shape of, this, of the cylinders and you may not pick that up uh, on a two-point gauge because the distortion that you're going to see is a three-dimensional shape and with a standard bore gauge, you're only going to see a two-dimensional uh, picture. So I think this obscene amount of dicum is plenty for us to get a get an idea of what's happening. I think the blue almost would have been easier. So we're going to debate what works better, blue or red. And I am from Stockton, so this is pretty standard <laughs> affair for me. <laughs> So right now we have 180 grit diamonds in our eight stone head here. I've adjusted the stroke length on the machine for the cylinder length. Uh, so we're just a tad over six and three quarter. So the goal here, just do a few strokes. Wow, those diamonds sound good. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Yeah. And you can't measure that with the two-point gauge. Uh, earlier, Nick was measuring it with the dial bore gauge. And he's going, are you sure this torque light's going to make that big of a difference? And I go, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you can see that this top third of the cylinder has all that dicum left over. And that's, how, that's where the head bolts are affecting the bore geometry. And that top third is uh, the most critical area on your bore geometry. And that's where your ring seal really matters. Yeah. Now that we know where it is, I'm curious if it's easy to see. Two. Yeah, not really. Let's look this way because we can actually see the spot where we need to measure now. So there were two thousands. I don't know, I might have a little parallax with the gauge, but what is it there? Two and a few tenths? Two and a couple tenths. Two, two and a couple. Yeah. I'm not gonna sweat a couple tenths, but all that's telling me is that you can't see the distortion from the torque plate using a dial bore gauge. Yeah. Like I said, this, this gets a two dimensional measurement and this is a three dimensional issue. 
Okay, so now we got a light where we can really see it. And you can see the distortion is in line with the fasteners there. You can see, especially like right there, that one, for whatever reason, uh, particularly distorted. Honestly, it's like kind of the same and it's all, all right where the fasteners are, which you would expect. You know, on the, some of the LS platforms at my old job, we take brand new blocks and mind you, these things may, if they dyno that 300 horsepower to the wheel, you know, take those same blocks, hone them five over with the torque plate, um, everything else, apples to apples, we picked up 40 horsepower yeah. with just a torque plate hone and that's all ring seal. Well, let's do the next cylinder just for fun and then we'll start going through and hone. I'm gonna go slow again so that we don't crash because it's very expensive when you crash diamonds. Whoa. That is crazy. <laughs> Holy cow. That's, uh, that's crazy. You wonder why these engines only lasted 50,000 miles. <laughs> you see that? Yeah. And Stop. I think, I, I think with, the, with the eight stone head, like you can tell this even more than we could with our two stone. Yeah. Cause again, it's just like with the bore gauge, when you're measuring two points with the bore gauge, I mean, it would, it would fall right into that probably and, and just hone it and you wouldn't notice. All kinds of weird stuff. So. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they're going to this style of a hone head as opposed to the two stones and a guide that we've used for decades. Uh, Cause that's gonna wanna follow that shape and you might not actually see that if you didn't have a rigid hone head set up like that. So that's why we're using a torque plate. This is why we're using a torque plate. Despite having little tiny thin rings that hopefully are conforming. <laughs> yeah, though I gotta say, the engines that, were tor that weren't torque plate honed and didn't last all that long probably made your dad's career because they kept did. him nice and busy. Yeah. <laughs> Facts. I'm gonna go back to this first cylinder and let's just try to take maybe a couple thousandths out and see See what it looks like then. So with a few more tenths out, you can still see uh, a little bit of that distortion, but I think it's starting to clean up there pretty well. So I uh, still have not removed a lot of material here. So right now I'm just letting the hone do its thing, running through. I've brought these two cylinders to within about three and a half thousandths of finish size, or three and a half or four. I'm gonna bring these other two there as well. And then we're gonna do, we're gonna switch over to the finish stones and just do a couple, ex, you know, kind of experimental runs to see if we can figure out uh, how many strokes we're gonna need with our 600 grit CBNs to get our peaks down and get the surface finish parameters that we're really hoping for. So with the new diamond head, it, I mean, this thing runs pretty much by itself. It's almost as automatic as they want you to think it is. Just kind of let it run. Takes a while because we do have a lot of material to take out. We're taking about 10 thousandths out on, on most of these cylinders here. So definitely would have been nice to have bored it a little bit closer, but this will be fine. So at this point, I have all of this side within about three and a half thousandths of our finish size. Three and a half to four thousandths. Some of you are gonna be pretty happy because I, uh, I got a new gauge here that has a cleaner, nicer looking face. So maybe you can actually see the numbers. But at this point, I've switched over to the 600 CBN uh, stones and we're gonna just kind of do some experimenting here with our numbers. I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna hone them about, well, I'm gonna pick a cylinder basically, and I'm gonna go five strokes with these stones and we're gonna test it. And then I'll maybe go 10 strokes and we're gonna test it. And we're gonna see where we wanna be on our surface finish parameters. So when I run these here, I'm gonna try to go really, really low on the pressure to where they're just barely 
barely touching at all. And we're gonna try to be really consistent as we go across here so we can actually get the right numbers. Let's put the profilometer on it. So that was five strokes. So we definitely need to go a little bit more than that. So that was 10. Let's give it three more and see what it does. Ah. RK47, RPK14, RVK65. I think we're gonna settle on 13 strokes. I'm gonna test it on those other three and then we'll move on. So this is pretty much what we're looking for. A uh, recommendation from Total Seal told us on our RK to shoot for 40 to 50, on our peaks to go eight to 15, and on our valleys to shoot for anywhere from 40 to 60. And you can see on our, uh, on our valleys, we're a little bit over 60 there, but being a little too deep is not gonna hurt anything. Our peaks were anywhere from about nine to 14. Uh, our, and again, this wasn't super consistent here, but just kind of a practice run. Uh, our RK, core roughness, we did have one that was 36, but the rest of these were all right there in the 40s. And I mean, we're, we're right in the ballpark of what their recommendation to shoot for was. So I think at this point, I'm gonna put the 180s back in. We're gonna take it to size and then we'll come back and we'll do our 13 strokes and we'll call it good, roll over to the other side and repeat. So we're back at it, just gonna go down the line and we're gonna open these up to our finished bore size. So we'll bring them to zero on the gauge. And right now, again, I've got the 180 diamonds back in, the rough grit. What we were doing there was just kind of getting an idea of if our process was going to be right to get us the surface finish numbers that we want. Now that we know that it's going to work, we're actually going to hone this out to our finished size and then we'll switch back over and finish them out. At most, a couple tenths uh, looser than our size. So we've got that cylinder uh, to that finished size and I've set the stop on the machine and I'll actually kind of show you what that looks like. As this machine ratchets, it, it comes up on where it says off and that's when it turns the machine off basically uh, when it's run the stones out to a certain dimension. And that never really worked super well with the vitrified abrasives because those stones actually break down and they wear themselves. That doesn't really happen on the diamonds. I mean, they, they'll they last hundreds of blocks usually. Anyway, with that stop set, now we should be able to run over to these next three cylinders. And what I'm actually doing, uh, the strategy that I'm using it's not the right terminology for a hone, but I'm essentially letting it spark out where I let the machine run until it hits that stop. Then I back off the feed, start it again, and let it run to that same stop. And then I'll back it off one more time and run to that same stop. And that seems to get a really consistent size, you know, just by trusting the machine at that stop. So we're gonna go through, finish home the rest of these, and then we'll switch over to our 600 CBN and put our plateau on it. So now all of these are at our minimum size or a couple tenths. I mean, they're, you're a tenth over minimum. 
kind of right at minimum. Maybe a tenth. Kind of right there, maybe a tenth. So I'm going to switch over to our 600 CBN and we'll do our 13 strokes and run the profilometer through it real quick and check. And if everything looks good, we'll roll over to the other side and get it finished up. So we went through and did our 13 strokes with our 600 grit CBN. So this bank should be to our finished size right now. Uh, I actually went through with the bore gauge and we came out cylinder two, four, two, 55 and a 10th. Uh, and the rest of these were about four, two, 55 and two tenths. Uh, maybe two tenths variation from top to bottom. Uh, but with this eight stone diamond head, they come out super, super straight super round and I mean the ease of which we can get to size is just ridiculous honestly. So we're gonna put the profilometer in and let's start with cylinder two. For those of you who don't know the profilometer has a little tiny stylus tip and what it'll do is drag that along the cylinder wall and it will measure all of the peaks and valleys in that surface finish of the cylinder wall. And we've got a nice little holder here to hold it in place. So we'll put this in and we'll hit start. Not really easy to film that, but that little stylus right now is tracing along. And here on the screen, here. that graph is kind of a representation of the cylinder wall, uh, showing all of the dips and the peaks, kind of the mountains and valleys of the surface finish. So our RK core roughness, we're at 38. Uh, what were our numbers we were shooting for? Between 40 to 50-ish on RK. Uh, peaks and valleys, peaks we were shooting for between 8 to 15, and we're just shy of 15. Our valleys, we were shooting for 40 to 60, and we're right at 54. So I think this is going to be right, right where we need to be. And there's a, another pretty little picture of it. So what happens if you get this wrong? This is kind of one of those things that has become more important with modern rings. Um, thinner rings and rings with uh, coatings. For instance, a lot of the stuff we do here in our shop are cast iron rings and they're super forgiving. You know, we don't do a lot of these steel rings with uh, the, the coatings on them. And the cast rings are actually a little bit what they say is that they're actually somewhat porous. Uh, they'll actually hold some oil in the ring. So the cylinder wall itself doesn't need to have as deep of valleys necessarily to hold the oil. But when you get to these steel rings with coatings, uh, they don't have any ability to hold any oil in the ring itself. So you have to have the valleys that are gonna hold the oil there. And then we knock the peaks off those to get the ring you know, somewhere to seat and seal. Just in layman's terms kind that resonates with me is get a little too rough it's probably will act like a file and wear out your rings instantly then you'll have a ring seal issue another thing is if the geometry of your surface finish is all screwed up then another thing that can happen is that the top of those peaks that you hone into the cylinders those will get knocked off on on first startup and all of that cylinder wall ends up in your oil pan and that yeah that extra debris probably not the best thing inside of your motor right for an engine like this, definitely super, super critical to get these numbers right. And that's why, you know, we're taking all the time here and, and really knocking out our process and doing our checks. But I, I like to make things as good as we possibly can, regardless of whether it's a freaking Ferrari 
or an Alice Chalmers tractor like my dad drives out in the field, but some I, of this stuff can be pretty forgiving sometimes. I have a pretty big issue with something you just said. I think What's you just that? implied that Ferrari uh, requires good machine work. Ah, uh, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> you get the point. Like, just, just people see a lot of value in a big name like that and think that, oh, that needs to be perfect. Um, and, and I wasn't necessarily making any comments about Ferrari. I was more making the comment that uh, regardless of what kind of value you see in a tractor or somebody's clapped out sedan, we still try to make it perfect either way. I can sense the cease and desist from the Ferrari oh, yeah. <laughs> lawyers coming right now. <laughs> now to the folks out there that'll him and haw and go, well, I've done this for 40 something years and never had a problem. Oh, we got tools now, use them. It's a good point. <laughs> I, I don't know why you wouldn't. We can uh, make it better, so why shouldn't we? Yeah, exactly, and it's going to give you better repeatability. You're going to improve your product. Why wouldn't you improve? Cylinder two, our peaks are even lower. Valley, uh, Valley 45, RK 35, that's, that's a fine range. Cylinder number four, a little bit lower on our valleys, 44.41, so I may not have had as much pressure on the rough stones or maybe a little bit more pressure on the finished stones but 11 on the peaks, 39 on the RK. Cylinder six, 10 on the peaks, 52 on the RVK, 39 on the RK. Pretty good spot again. This is like one of the first few blocks that I've honed with this new hone head. I'm still learning, you know, the process and getting the load right. So there will be a little bit of variability. Another thing to point out, this cylinder here, uh, that was actually the cylinder with a sleeve in it. So that one obviously is gonna be a little bit different as well. Or is it this one? Now I can't remember. No, it's this cylinder. I don't know. Our core roughness is really consistent. Peaks are within, you know, three here. Actually, three of them are within about one, and there's one that's a little bit higher. And our valleys kind of all between 45 to 55. I'd say that's a good spot to be. People I've talked to said worry about size first and surface finish second. So that's kind of what we did here, and I think it came out really nice. So we'll roll over to the other side and make it match. All right, so we're on to bank two. Hopefully we can just run through these real quick and knock them out, get it done. Okay, so second side here, we ran through as quick as we could and brought all four cylinders to size. So now we've got our 600 CBNs. We're gonna do our 13 strokes. Run through 13 strokes on each hole. Oh, shit. that was almost bad. It was kind of aimed up a little more than I thought. Definitely had higher pressure on that one. Two tenths. I think we actually straightened out a little bit. Three tenths. Too far. Straight as heck, though. Damn. Pretty dang good. So with that, all of our cylinders are finished here on this bank of the block, actually on both banks, so we can get the torque plate off and get this block kind of cleaned up. We do still have a few more checks that we need to do before we're ready to do any final assembly, but we're gonna clean it up here so it's not all oily to do those. 
Uh, as far as our surface finish parameters, we came out with an average uh, on our valleys of 49. It's right where we want to be. Our, our peaks are 11, kind of right where we want to be. And the average on our RK is 36. Uh, pretty good spot to be for this engine, for this application. So I think this is going to be this is going to be fun. We're going to keep moving forward here. Thank you.